Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our next uh, presentation is, uh, is entitled The Value of Mars Exploration and Settlement. And help me welcome James D. Heiser. My apologies for no slides. Apparently, we had a uh, fail with regard to the uh, uh, flash memory. So that's all we've got. Tend to work from a manuscript anyway. Um, I have deliberately picked about the most boring way to entitle this presentation um, because I'm going after it from a historical perspective and not from the way that valuation is usually considered in our culture today. Uh, which is to say, I'm less concerned with evaluating this like a libertarian or socialist only from the perspective of economic valuation. I'm more interested in the broader concept of value. A great deal of benefit in discussion of value of Mars exploration and settlement, precisely because of the wild, uh, wildly divergent ideas of what constitutes value. It should be stated at the outset, it's not my primary concern, therefore, to look at an economic answer which is sufficient to answer the question of the value of Mars exploration and settlement. The debate over the economics of space exploration has gone on for generations, and I expect that such a discussion will not come to an end anytime soon. In the determination of value, questions of economics have traditionally been seen as of secondary importance. Thus, the Scottish writer and philosopher Thomas Carlyle reflecting on the perversity of the imagination of Thomas Malthus, declared that economics is, and I quote, a dreary, desolate, and indeed quite abject and distressing science, what we might call the dismal science. And one may only listen to just so many blue sky economic models for making a quick buck beyond Leo before the truly dismal character of such machinations is indelibly impressed upon one's mind. The success of SpaceX is not proof of a theory of value based solely in economics, rather Elon Musk's passion and vision considering the value of exploring and colonizing Mars ultimately has very little to do with economic profits, though of course making such profits makes it possible to accomplish his actual values in association with uh, such a colonization endeavor. A recent Morgan Stanley study recently determined that the uh, that SpaceX could eventually be worth $120 billion, $120 billion. But even a most rudimentary understanding of Musk's motivation makes it clear that financial profit is far from being his primary motivation. When one is speaking in terms of establishing a colony of a million people on another world, not for the purpose of trying to figure out how simply to establish industry and export profit back to Earth, but rather the concern for doing so is the continuation of the human species. We've left questions of the value in economic terms alone far behind. At the same time, those who oppose such efforts aimed at exploration and colonization also speak in terms which often go far beyond the confines of economics. Thus, for example, and, and only one of many recent examples, Samantha Rolfe, lecturer in astrobiology and principal technical officer at uh, uh, Bayfordbury Observatory, recently wrote an article nice and neutrally titled as follows, Elon Musk's starship may be uh, more moral catastrophe than bold step in space exploration. And it kind of goes downhill from there. Her concerns are centered on what have become commonplace talking points among those who are opposed to human exploration and colonization. That is, the invocation of planetary protection and fears of contamination of the Martian environment and the risks to the lives of potential explorers, as if astronauts did not have some grasp of the risks of space exploration and the risks which attend being on the ISS for extended periods of time and being exposed to radiation and all of the attendant dangers of being in space. So. On both sides of the equation, usually far more than just economic questions are involved. So for this presentation, I'm going to be more interested in examining Mars from the perspective of value, working from several definitions of the term. First, the regard that something is held to deserve, the importance, worth, or usefulness of something. And second, a person's principles or standards of behavior, one's judgment of what is important in life. Toward this end, we will offer a few passing historical points of interest in the weighing of the value of a new land, 
and looking at this um, in the time when such questions were first evaluated. So we'll go really far back for a start in terms of colonization or settlement, if we want that more neutral term. Um, it was certainly colonization at the time that we're thinking of it in the historical context we'll look at first. So at the conclusion of the first preserved work of historical writing, Herodotus's The Histories, that the author of that seminal work confronted his readers with a fundamental choice for the future of their civilization. The choice is cast in the council of Cyrus the Great to one Artambaris. Herodotus records that after Cyrus's victory over Astyages, the king of the Medes, there were those within his own kingdom, including Artambaris, who counseled Cyrus to rest on the spoils of his great victory and embrace an easy life. To quote from Herodotus, since they said God has given empire to the Persians and among individuals to you, Cyrus, by your conquest of Astyages, let us leave this small and barren country of ours and take possession of a better. There are plenty to choose from, some near, some further off. If we take one of them, we shall be admired more than ever. It is the natural thing for a sovereign people to do. And when will there be better opportunity than now, when we are masters of many nations and all Asia? Cyrus did not think much of the suggestion. He replied that they might act upon it if they pleased, but added the warning that if they did so, they must prepare themselves to rule no longer, but to be ruled by others. Soft countries, he said, breed soft men. It is not the property of any one soil to produce fine fruits and good soldiers, too. The Persians had to admit that, they, that this was true, and that Cyrus was wiser than they. So they left him and chose rather to live in a rugged land and rule than to cultivate rich plains and be subject to others. End of quote from Brontus. The point is, the first time we encounter history, people are evaluating the land in terms of its civilizational importance. In other words, what kind of nation, what kind of people do you want to be? It will interact, that construct in your mind, with the realities of the land in which you settle. Um, Robert touched on that a little bit this morning in terms of the Malthusian notions of if you believe yourself to live in a period of limited resources, regardless of whether those resources are actually limited, you will act on others and among yourselves in a way consistent with that value which you've allowed to govern your mindset. What Herodotus, therefore, was essentially describing is the interplay between environments and cultural formation in the context of a vision for the future of a civilization. As philosopher Paul Schoolison observed in his essay entitled The Idea of Culture, and I quote, we will never overcome our feelings of discovering nature as this totality, independent of our will, into which we are born, also independently of our will. I, he says, I presume. This feeling of, or natural motion is, I believe, the only foundation of culture, if foundation there is. Land, language, and history are the grounds for each and every culture. End quote. That which is valued in a particular culture is the fruit of a complex interplay of such factors, so that one may anticipate certain broad outlines in the course of a civilization, while certain aspects escape anticipation. Well, why then would a civilization seek to inhabit a new world? I'd have us consider, then, from the very font of this, con of this conversation at the dawn of the, our modern age, and consider briefly the motivation set forth already in the 17th century for such an endeavor. I was going to lead off with a slide now omitted with a quote from Kepler writing to Galileo. He said, there will be plenty of people unafraid of the empty void. In the meantime, we shall prepare for the brave sky traveler maps of the celestial bodies. I shall do this for the moon, you, Galileo, for Jupiter. Already there was this understanding of launching forth into the void. It's, it's particularly fascinating in consideration of Kepler because he was incapable of, with his own eyes, seeing and measuring the stars that he was, and planets that he was considering. His vision was extremely poor. And if it was not for Brahe's observations, he could have done none of the work that he accomplished. He had to rely on someone else's data to see the stars which he couldn't behold with his own eyes. Just too blurry. and We hadn't gotten there with the glasses yet. But he continued further in his writings with, uh, back and forth with uh, Galileo. He said, would it not be excellent to describe the cyclic mores of our time in vivid colors, but in doing so, 
to be on the safe side, to leave this earth and go to the moon. In other words, understand our time precisely by leaving our world. Well, this is already in the 16 teens, these thinking in that reflective term of evaluating our world from that perspective. So that in 1609, he could envision in his dream, uh, Somnium, the idea of being able to stand on the surface of the moon and look at the earth. That was 1609. That alone makes it worth going back and reading his works, I think, to have that kind of vision. But a more expansive work was undertaken in 1638. Um, in his book, A World in the Moon, Bishop John Wilkins, who was the chief founder and first secretary of the Royal Society, was openly spe uh, speculating about the prospects of men setting forth into space after the fashion of the great explorers of the ter uh, terrestrial globe. And I quote at length. And I'm sorry, there'll be a number of lengthy quotes from but I think it's worth consideration. Keeping in mind, 1638. He wrote, In the first ages of the world, the islanders either thought themselves to be the only dwellers upon the earth, or else if they were, there were any other, yet they could not possibly conceive how they might have commerce with them, being severed by the deep and broad sea. But the aftertimes found out the invention of ships, in which notwithstanding none but some bold, daring men durst venture, there being few so resolute as to commit themselves unto the vast ocean. And yet, how easy a thing it is this, even to a timorous and cowardly nature. So perhaps there may be some other means invented for a conveyance to the moon, and though it may seem a terrible and impossible thing ever to pass through the vast spaces, yet no question there would be some men who durst, who durst venture this as well as the other. But by the time this book reached its fourth edition, almost 40 years later, it had been retitled a discovery of a new world, or a discourse tending to prove that tis probable there may be another habitable world in the moon. Yeah, all the titles are like that in that period. You know, how you make a title fill an entire page. What Wilkins had once stated tentatively, he now declared decisively. Again, to quote from the related passage. And yet now, how easy a thing is this even to a timorous and cowardly nature, and questionless, in other words, undoubtedly, the invention of some other means for our conveyance to the moon cannot seem more incredible to us than this did at first to them, and therefore we have no just reason to be discouraged in our hopes of the like success. End quote. For Wilkins, having reasoned according to the best means of measurement available to him in 1638, that the world is at least 179,712 miles from the Earth, understood that the ability to reach the moon would steadily follow attainments which might seem to pale by comparison. To quote, that whenever that art is invented, or any other, whereby a man may be conveyed some 20 miles high, in other words, 100,000 feet, roughly, or thereabouts, then tis not altogether improbable that some or other may success, be successful in this attempt. In short, if you can build a craft capable of reaching 20 miles in elevation, you can go to the moon. U2, 1957, SR-71, 1964. He got that one right. And Wilkins saw such an endeavor as far from a journey which would be limited in scope. Again, to quote, Yet I do seriously and upon good grounds affirm it possible to make this flying chariot in, in which a man may sit and give such motion unto it as shall convey him through the air. And this perhaps might be made large enough to carry diverse men at the same time, together with food for their viaticum and commodities for traffic. Is it not the bigness of anything of this kind that can hinder its motion, if the motive faculty be answerable thereto? We see a great ship swims as well as a small cork, and an eagle flies in the air as well as a little gnat." End quote. But getting past that broad understanding of the universality of the principle, he turns to the question of, why do it? Why should men risk such an endeavor? Wilkins explained, the perfecting of such an invention would be of such excellent use that if it were enough not only to make a man famous, but the age also wherein he lives. For besides the strange discoveries that might occasion in this other world, it would be also of inconceivable advantage for traveling above any other conveyance that's now in use. For that notwithstanding all these seeming impossibilities, it is likely enough that there may be a means invented of journeying to the moon. And how happy shall they be that are first successful in this attempt? The value seems to be in no small part one of redounding fame, 
the value of the knowledge should be gained and the improvement of the human condition which would attend the innovation. And it's thus that Wilkins concludes the first volume of his work as follows. In here one may have that strong fancy, we're better able to set forth the great benefits and pledge to be had by such a journey. And that whether you consider the strangeness of the persons, language, art, policy, religion of those inhabitants, for he took for granted that any world that we would reach would be inhabited, together with the new traffic that might be brought thence. In brief, do but consider the pleasure and profit of these latter discoveries in America, and we must needs conclude this to be inconceivable beyond it. So in other words, what's he going for? Precisely the, the question of the strangeness of the persons, language, art, policy, in other words, political thoughts, different use of the English, religion of these inhabitants. He wants to meet other people, other rational beings that he takes for granted we will be able to communicate with and learn from them. That's the whole point. It's for the profit of civilization. Wilkin takes it for granted that there we would encounter intelligent life, and that interaction with such beings would have much to teach us in every area of human endeavor, new traffic, i.e. trade, being listed almost as an afterthought. Now, in the second volume of this work, Wilkins returns to this theme at its conclusion, reasoning that travel to other wor worlds was to be undertaken in part for the advancement of astronomy. For he writes, since therefore in these respects it is one of the most excellent sciences in nature, it may best deserve the industries of man, who is one of the best works of nature. Other creatures were made with their heads and eyes turned downward. Would you know why, why man was not created so too? <coughs> why it was that he might be an astronomer. Of course, there he's just cribbing from Ovid, but that's okay, it's a good source. <laughs> but this advancement of science Wilkins understood to be consistent with his faith. For, I quote, it proves a God and a providence and incites our hearts to greater admiration and fear of his omnipotency. We may understand by the heavens how much mightier he is that made them. For by the greatness and beauty of the creatures, fortunately the maker of them is, see, is seen, saith the book of wisdom, chapter 13. Th this matter of the advancement of knowledge and contemplation of creation was chief among Wilkins' motivations, so brace yourself for a long quote. It may also stir us up to behave ourselves answerably, he writes, unto the noble and divine nature of our souls, when I consider the heavens the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? as to create such vast, glorious bodies for his service. Again, when I consider with myself the strange immensity and bigness of this universe, in comparison to which this earth of ours is but an indiscernible point, when I consider that I carry a soul about me of far greater worth than all this, and desires that are of a wider extent and more unbounded capacity than this frame of nature, that methinks it must needs argue a degenerateness and poverty of spirit to busy my faculties about so ignoble, narrow a subject as any of these earthly things. What a folly it is in men to have such high conceits of themselves for some small possessions which they have in, this, in the world above others to keep so great a bustle about so poor a matter. Tis but a little point which with so much ado is distributed unto so many nations by fire and sword. What great matter is it to be a monarch of a small part of a point? Might not the ants as well divide a little molehill into the diverse provinces and keep as great a stir in disposing of their governments? All this place wherein we war and travel and dispose of kingdoms is but a point far less than any of those small stars that at this distance are scarcely discernible, which when it, the soul does seriously meditate upon, it will begin to despise the narrowness of its present habitation and think of providing for itself a mansion in those wider spaces such as may be more agreeable to the nobleness and divinity of its nature." End quote. He fully understood our place in the cosmos, and he understood that as a created place in which what was to be called forth from man was a humility with regard to our own actions and our own affairs in this world, while recognizing the singular place of a self-reflective consciousness, a soul in man capable of weighing one's actions be they good or bad. For Wilkins, the created heaven set forth a challenge for human nature to confront that those, than those opposed by grubbing in the marketplace and fighting over petty worldly kingdoms. Such things have their place, even necessity in his worldview. But the scandal for Bishop Wilkins is found in people debasing themselves by corrupting their souls to seek nothing more than them. 
That is, rather than viewing them as instrumental, they behold wealth and power as an end in themselves, which is idolatry. Three writes, now when we lay all this together, that he who hath most in the world hath almost nothing of it, that the earth itself in comparison to the universe is but an inconsiderable point, and yet that this whole universe does not bear so great proportion to the soul of man as the earth does to that, I say when a man in some retired thought shall lay all this together, it must needs stir up his spirit to a contempt of these earthly things, and making places love and endeavor upon those comforts that may be more answerable to the excellency of his nature. End quote. I believe the sentiment which Wilkins endeavors to express is that which is summarized in Matthew, the eighth chapter. For what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? The vastness of the universe did not escape his comprehension. He recognizes that the astonishing fact of the human soul dwarfs the universe, even as the vast scale of the cosmos dwarfs the earth. Such clarity of perception preserves the wonder which undergirds the pursuit of knowledge. It is the faithful awe that's expressed by the psalmist in Psalm 8, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man, that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Or as we read in the Apocrypha in Wisdom 13, Surely vain are all men by nature, who are ignorant of God, and could not out of the good things that are seen know him that is. Neither by considering the works did they acknowledge the workmaster, but deemed either fire or wind, or the swift air, or the circle of the stars, or the violent water, or the light of heaven, to be the gods which govern the world. With whose beauty, if they be delighted, took them to be gods. Let them know how much better the Lord of them is, for the first author of beauty hath created them. But if they were astonished at their power and virtue, let them understand by them how much mightier he is that made them. For by the greatness and beauty of the creatures, propor proportionally, the maker of them is seen. So for wisdom. There's a profound question posed near the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, which confronts the, value, the topic of value. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? The tragedy is that in the minds of many people today, the answer to the question which is given is to say no. The re resounding no dominating much of what passes for political discourse, which is obsessed with economic questions concerning the fairness of the distribution of wealth, the strength of the economy, the development of markets, the regulation or deregulation of various industries, distract us from what we're actually about. There is value in such things, but it's instrumental. When such things become idols, there can be no perceived, no, there's no telos beyond them to which they are pointing. They're just an end in the labor itself. Wilkins ends his work with the following observation. Those great costly pyramids which were built to perpetuate the memory of their founders shall sooner perish and molder away into their primitive dust than the names of such worthies uh, that shall be forgotten. The monuments of learning are more durable than the monuments of wealth or power. I would do as well to remember that. Monuments of learning are more durable than the monuments of wealth and power. In an age like ours, we are told not to believe such things. We should believe in the truth. Wilkins believed in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, like his contemporary Johannes Kepler. This provided the foundation for his scientific endeavors. He knew that learning was more precious than wealth and power, and he trusted the author of all things. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> hopefully not all history needs to be boring. Um, hopefully I can make some value in that. Is there, are there any questions? I we have one at all. I, was, I thought that was fascinating. A little deep. Well, yeah, I mean, I just, this is what always intrigues me about when we look through what our predecessors actually wrote. There's a lot of wisdom there to be grasped. Yeah. And when we just sort of skip over and take the cartoonish, you know, mistreatment of our forefathers and just say, well, you know, people believe this, that, or the other thing. Nonsense. Read what they wrote. Like in any other age, there'll be lots of it that's gibberish. I mean, good heavens today, look at what gets published. But there's a lot of value there. And when you can go back that far and say, 
from the opportunity to reflect on centuries of history, would that the course of the developments of civilization been guided more by what he was setting forth as the principles? What if that course set forth in the 1630s of meeting other civilizations for the purpose of learning from them had been what had been allowed to govern? Maybe it was overly idealistic. Um, so, um, with some measure of understanding, bishops tend to also have to interact with the realities of life in the world. Yes, sir? I think it's practical, not idealistic. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at what Bartholomew de las Casas did in saving the Native Americans from complete decimation by talking to the Spanish crown and saying, look, what you're doing is wrong, yes. and finally getting the Pope to go along and saying, no, uh, Native Americans are humans. They are not just talking monkeys. Exactly. Uh, and uh, yeah, it is practical, but uh, how do you value um, human life and how do you value space exploration? Uh, I think you touched on it. How do we value truth? I will also, just as a very passing note, because I know I'm out of time. And Wilkins did not write this after he was already established in his position. He wrote this from the beginning of his career and then continued to revise it. He was ordained a priest in the same year that he wrote this book. So in other words, he was not resting on you know, the, the strength that he brought to the equation of already having stationed the church. It was, dis, if you will, despite this book, they went on to then be one of the founders of the Royal Society the next year. And they advanced to uh, being master of Trinity College, Cambridge and also then eventually becoming a bishop of the church. So again, when we get the cartoon versions of ecclesiology in the 16th and 17th century, this is also part of the reality, was that he could speculate this way in public for a lay audience, because it was written in English, um, and it was not something which was seen as deleterious to church teaching or to the general health of society, but rather something which singled him out for advancement in the realm of science and the church. So just something to think about. Thank you.